Hi, everybody. Jeff Toyster here, and I'm joined today by New York Times bestselling author and customer service expert, Shep Hyken, who's got a great new book called The Convenience Revolution. Shep, how are you doing today? I am doing great, Jeff. It's great to see you. Great to be here. Excited to talk about the book. So I wonder, just to get us started, can you tell us a little bit about the book? And then the big question that I have is, how did you come up with the idea for it? Sure. And this is what it's going to look like when uh, it, you get it. It's Although this is a softbound advanced reader's copy with lots of mistakes. I don't even have my hardbound copy yet, but I think it's going to be here today or next week sometime. So uh, a little bit about the book and how I came up with it kind of goes together. So it was last year when I wrote another book titled Be Amazing or Go Home. And I just happened to be talking to the guy that was helping me do the final edits, the grammar, the punctuation. And he's a pretty smart guy because he'll say, Shep, you need to expand on this story. It's not strong enough. So he goes, Shep, you know, we started talking and he says, I noticed there's something about a lot of the companies that you write about. What? And he mentioned that, you know, they're, they're really the highest level of customer service, but you actually find companies that I've never heard of before. Where do you find them and, I, and why do you like them? And I realized the reason I like them is because, you know what, they're easy to do business with. And I started to think, why do I love Amazon so much? It's what customer service do they really provide? By the way, they're a really top notch at service. They create a system that works. If there's a problem, by the way, there's no phone number for you to call them. They put you through a system. And then if you get to a point where you need to talk to somebody, they'll say, we'll call you. I mean, and I started thinking, well, that's pretty convenient. And I realized the companies I love most are the most convenient to do business with. So I said, I wonder if there's anything out there about convenience. One book, a friend of mine, Matt Dixon, I don't know if you ever interviewed him. Awesome, awesome dude. He wrote a book with his partner called uh, The Effortless Experience. A little different than what I have here because what I have is more about uh, the process, the whole experience, and the idea that that service, uh, you've got customer service and then you've got convenience on top of that uh, to create really, uh, uh, you know, you're going to lock in your customers for life as long as you deliver a good product, a good level of service, and you're easier to do business with than anyone else. You own that customer. Well, and I like how you gave a, a, a shout out to, to Matt's book because it, it was such a great read, but I, I think we need more in that space. So I'm, I'm excited to read your book. I, I've got a chance to read it already and really enjoyed it. And, and one of the things I liked that you did was you laid out several principles and you were, it seemed like you were careful up front to say, maybe these will apply to you, maybe they won't, but but some of them probably will, if, if not all. And, and one that, that really jumped out for me was self-service because this is such yes. a, a big topic these days. And a conversation I've had with a lot of customer service leaders is, is this, how do you offer great self-service that's very convenient without missing out on the human element that often is what really drives a great experience? Sure, and by the way, the point about self-service and customer service professionals, meaning the call centers and support centers that you do a lot of work with, that's where that effortless experience that Matt talks about really plays in. You know, we're talking across all different types of businesses and markets and, and but here, let's talk about self-service for a moment. Um, I don't know if you use the self-service lane at the grocery store, you know, the lines are crowded, you've only got a few items. And of course they've got their, their uh, lane that where the cashier, it says 12 items or less. And you always look at somebody's bag and there's like 47 items in the bag and they're in that line. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> but they, it, it, like the grocery stores I go to, they have a self-service area where there's, four, and same thing, I went to Home Depot, they have one there. You can go check out on your own. But you ever notice that there's always a human being, an employee, standing nearby to help the people that struggle with the self-service? Because a lot of them, it's still a fairly new concept and they're learning how to do it. That is first and foremost the most important thing, that you back up any self-service you have with a human backup. So if you're gonna use uh, online self-service for, let's say you've got technical support and if you can get the questions asked online, frequently asked questions, or maybe uh, there's a chat bot that's interacting with you. 
always a backup. Now I used for the case study, there, there's five case studies underneath each of the six convenience principles. Self-service, obviously one of them. I used a company called Panera Bread in North America, very popular. They're basically a bakery uh, sandwich place. I was there this morning. And I noticed every Friday morning, by the way, I go to a Panera and I have breakfast with my buddies. We work out together and then we all go over there for breakfast. And I noticed over like a year and a half period, things were changing. For example, you would normally stand in line and finally get up to the cashier, place your order, and then you would go off to the side and there would be somebody saying, you know, Shep, your order's ready. And you'd stand there and wait and they'd eventually make your food and give it to you. You'd either leave or go sit down in the restaurant. So what they did is they added a kiosk where you can go and place your own order and avoid the line. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. It was easier. Then I would go over and they'd do the same thing. They'd call my name. Then one day I noticed they had pagers. So they didn't have to call my name anymore. I found out from the manager that occasionally there's somebody with the same name as somebody else and they get the wrong food. So this was their way of making it better, in effect, more convenient because the customer didn't have to come back in if there was a mistake. And then they added another level, which is they put sensors in the table so you didn't have to wait for the pager to go off and then walk up to the counter. You just sit at a table, the pager would go off and guess what? They would bring you the food. Whether you're leaving to go with it or to stay, you'd sit at the table and wait. And I asked the manager as I was getting ready to use them as a case study, I go, why do you do this? Why have you made this transformation? Exact words, because it's more convenient for our customers or our guests. That's what they use the term guest. I thought exactly what I was hoping for. Now, here's what's cool. They didn't eliminate any employees. As a matter of fact, they use the opportunity as they're running the food out to the customer to engage with them at another level that they couldn't engage with before when they're just handing the food across uh, the, uh, the counter. So uh, no loss of employees, better human interaction, total self-service experience. And I like that example because it's not one versus the other. It's self-service. It's an integrated. Amazing. You said the better engagement without increasing costs. The customers are happy. The employees are probably happier as well to engage people. But I think it's interesting you, you talk about cost. And one thing I, I had to ask you about, you have a story in there about Kirkwood Audi. Yeah. And, and this, this dealership, uh, for, those, if, when, for those who are, are watching this, uh, when you read the book, um, I, I'm sure different stories are gonna jump out for different people. The, the story that jumped out for me was the dealership that basically says, we don't have a waiting room if you need an oil change or whatever it is, we're going to come get you and, and, or come get your car right. and make it as convenient as possible. And I, I thought two things immediately. One, that's fantastic. And two, how can they afford to do that? Sure. And, and so well, that's I, the question. How do companies afford to do something yeah. like that? Well, I think it must be working. And I'll tell you why. Um, Kirkwood Audi is a small dealership uh, compared to the other Audi dealerships in the area. Now, I had been doing business with another car dealership. By the way, this, there's two lessons here. Number one, this falls under the category of delivery. Take it to the customer. And we have a bunch of case studies. Kirkwood Audi was my lead case study. And they disrupted not an entire industry, but simply the competitor. Because companies like Uber disrupt an entire industry. Companies like Kirkwood Audi just say, what can we do better than our competitor? Which is a great lesson because you don't have to be a big company. You don't have to be having these grandiose goals of let's change the whole world. No, what they said is let's steal market share from the guy down the street. That's all they were looking for. I had been doing business for 22 years with this other dealership, actually probably more. I had bought in at least a half a dozen cars. Bought in, is that the word? I, I had purchased we know what you mean. <laughs> half a dozen cars, at least from this dealership. There was no real uh, love with any, I, I mean, I, there, my salespeople that came and went, I, the location was great, less than a mile from my office. Drop the car off. If they don't have a loaner, I walk to work, no big deal. Then I happened to see this car in the window. My wife says, look at that car. That's the car I want you to look at. And it was at another dealership, Kirkwood Audi. They're probably 10, 12 miles from my home. And I walked in and then right away I said to the salesperson, I'm just looking. Of course, that's what we always say. And he said, no problem. Um, and I, I looked at it and I actually, actually let me test drive it, even though I told him I wasn't interested in buying a car that day. And I came back and go, this was amazing. The problem is 
I'm not going to buy the car from you. You're too far away. And then he said, well, why is that a problem? I'm not going to drive, you know, 30, 40 minutes, you know, an hour round trip, whatever, you know, to drop my car off for an oil change, come back a few hours later, or sit around and wait. And he goes, sir, do you see a waiting room? And I go, no, we have one. It's behind the wall. It's small. Usually uh, we will bring the car to you and you don't ever have to you know, worry about it. We'll bring the car to you. We'll pick up your car or bring up a loaner. We'll pick up your car and we'll bring your car back when it's done. By the way, no extra charge. Here's the deal we'll make. Go shop it around, make sure we're competitive. And if you love it, come back. We'd love to have you as a customer. They want, I mean, it's like, I went back to my dealer and they, they wouldn't, they refused to do the delivery thing. And then they said, okay, we'll do it, but uh, we're going to charge you $500. I go, I I'm not interested in that. Okay, we'll do it, but we'll only do it while your car's under warranty. Well, Kirkwood's going, no strings attached. As long as you own the car, we'll come and pick it up and drop it off, et cetera, et cetera. He says, the next time you come back here will be to buy a new car. I go, I love that. And you know what? We're going on car number three right now. So, uh, and I know it's working because their little dealership has just purchased a huge piece of property and it's building a big building. So <laughs> it must be working. They're doing something right and they're growing as a result of this great service, a great convenient experience. Uh, and it's such a great example of uh, not just doing something right for your customer, but looking at your competitor and saying, how can we use service to differentiate? And, and I love the yeah. example of you had no intention of doing business with them. And, and now you're going on car number three. You're right. They, they have to be doing something well. And, and if the two dealerships are selling basically the same product, then you have to find a different way to stand out. So I, I love that example. That was that was really fun. Yeah, you outservice them, and if you can, outconvenience them. The company that's easier to do business with wins. And again, I want to emphasize, Kirkwood Audi. I mean, it's a car dealership. It's not like you're a solo entrepreneur or a tiny business with two or three people. But compared to some of the other companies that you think of, like Amazon, that's billions of dollars. Walmart, that's billions of dollars. Starbucks, they're also in the book, okay? But I wanted to get some of these smaller companies that are representative. In one of my books uh, a few years back, I can't remember which one it was. I think it was the Amazement Revolution. Convenience Revolution, Amazement Revolution. Uh, there was a gentleman, uh, his name was Ibrahim, out of, on the East Coast in Massachusetts. And he was a solo entrepreneur auto mechanic. And his differentiator was, you don't ever bring your car in for service. I come to you and fix the car on your location. And uh, that was, you know, and it wasn't even pick up and delivery. It's I'm, I'm bringing my mobile garage to you and people loved it and they set up their appointments and they're willing to pay for it. And, uh, and by the way, that while Kirkwood Audi was convenient services like Abraham was working on, he could charge more for the convenience. In some cases you can charge a lot more if you're convenient. And the example I use uh, is the mini fridge that you have in your, or the mini bar that you have in your hotel room. You open up that mini bar and there's, a, you know, a can of Coca-Cola for $5. And just down the hall in the vending machine, it's a buck and a quarter. And at the end of, you know, the stay, the uh, hotel staff is always restocking the mini bar. Why? It's much more expensive, but it's so much more convenient. So I, I love the examples of, of the small businesses, especially when we're talking about delivery. There, there was another chapter that you had in the book on technology mm -hmm. and, and that being you know, one of the principles. And, and you, know, I, you talk a lot about companies like Amazon. I'm a big fan of, of Amazon as well. And they, a lot of what they do is enabled by technology to drive convenience for the people they serve. And, and I'm wondering if, I can't come to my customer as a small business uh, and I have big companies like Amazon using technology to deliver products even in hours. How can I be just as convenient as a big business if I'm running a small or, or, or mid-sized business and I just don't have those kind of technological resources? Well, well, maybe you don't have technological resources and maybe technology isn't where you choose to stand out. By the way, technology is another one of the six. You've got, uh, let's just real quick run through them. Sure. You've got reducing friction, which all six reduce friction, but some companies use reducing friction as like their total value proposition. Technology, self-service, delivery, uh, the subscription model, and uh, let's see, did I do five of them? That five, access. Uh, access. 
you know better than I. You're testing me. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to test you. I should look. Uh, I think I mentioned reduced friction, self-service technology, uh, subscription. Oh, delivery. We already talked about that. And, and then, of course, access, which is, you know, are you available hours of operation? So you may not be able to afford the same technology that Amazon is if you're a tiny little small business or Amazon has. I want you to think about this. Small businesses have a tremendous advantage over sometimes the larger business. Why? Because just in the level of service that they provide, the relationship opportunity is much stronger when you know, hey, I deal with this company and I always talk to the owner of the company. It's a smaller business. So you've got a good relationship opportunity there. But when you go into the world of customer service, I want you to take a look at, you know, where can you reduce friction? Is there a technology out there? You know, creating an app is no longer that expensive. It's a few thousand dollars, not, you know, 30,000, 50,000 or $100,000. Now, obviously, Amazon and online companies like them have spent millions of dollars. They were the leaders. And as a result of their good work, the opportunity to have a shopping cart on your website um, hey, we've got one and I pay a monthly fee, a small monthly fee for that. Uh, it's not like it's all that expensive. And I want you to think about an app. How inexpensive can an, an, an app be? It could be, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking anybody to subscribe to my app, but if you go to the app store and you just type in Shep Hiken, there's a Shep Hiken app. And you know, it doesn't cost that much. I think I pay, I don't know, uh, a few hundred dollars a year to have that app, which gives the availability of my articles, my videos. And if I have a product that I want to promote, I can put it into that little app and it'll send a message to all the people that have the app on their phone. So very powerful. And it costs literally hundreds of dollars a year, not tens of thousands of dollars to develop. So no excuse not to use technology if it's the right thing for you. No, and, and that, that definitely makes sense. You know, when you're giving some of those examples, I, I think about the excuses that uh, we sometimes hear, but then also thinking about the advantages of small businesses. Like if I go into a restaurant and I've used technology to make a reservation, they'll know me by name. But if I go into my favorite restaurant, it doesn't matter if I have a reservation. They don't need technology to know my name. And, right. and it seems like the example of the small business is leveraging what you said. It's kind of leveraging where your strengths are to, to out convenience and out serve your competition, whatever that may be. Yeah. I, so I have a friend of mine who owns a restaurant down the street, small little restaurant, probably has 12 tables in it, maybe. And on a busy Saturday night, if I call him, he'll figure out a way to get me in. Okay. Yeah. You, what he's done is he, I know I can rely on him and it's convenient. Where am I going to go tonight? You know what? I'll just go to the place that's always there for me. Okay. And that's a, a level of convenience. And, you know, the, I talk about the no wait app as one of the technology apps, which is a really cool app. It, you make the, you don't make a res. And by the way, uh, open table, another great convenient app, but this is uh, if you don't have a reservation or a place doesn't even like there's restaurants that won't take reservations. So you can get on their list by going online and typing it in. And this happens to be the no wait app. It's not in every city and not every restaurant has it, but you might be able to go onto a restaurant's website and do the same thing. So you put in your name and you can actually watch your name going up the list. It tells you about how long it's going to be and you time your uh, arrival with the restaurant to hopefully have no wait. That's why they call it the no wait app. That's that's cool. I'm going to have to check that out. So one of the things that uh, you've talked about a couple of times here is that different principles might work better for different companies. And if you're reading the book, you really have to decide which apply to your business. And, and I imagine, you know, how to prioritize this. And so I, I wonder what advice would you give to business leaders and, and people who are reading the book that are trying to say, hey, these concepts look great. I see several areas where we can improve. Uh, where do I get started? Where do you How get do started? I prioritize? Sure. Well, first of all, the six areas we talked about, and I, I really thought there might be some other areas, and I was stretching to look for other areas. So I thought, no, these are the six concepts, and there might be others, and that's fine. So where do you get started in prioritizing? Some of them may jump out at you, then it's obvious. Otherwise, let's go back to the journey map that you create. And if you haven't created this, you need to do it no matter what, because it's important for all levels of service and experience. 
The journey map is nothing more than plotting out the journey the customer has with you. And there will be different journeys for different types of customers. There might be uh, a repeat customer. Well, let's, let's talk about the uh, automobile dealership since we're, we're, we're doing that. If I own an auto dealership, I have a journey map that's for sales. I have a journey map that's for, you know, when I bring my car in for service. Perhaps there's one for somebody that just comes in to buy a part at the parts window. There might be other journeys as well, but I have these main journeys that my customers take. Now, what I want to do is I want to identify every single interaction possibility that that customer is going to have with my dealership, with my people. And as I look at these, I'm thinking, where is their friction? Now, if I'm saying, okay, the customer buys the car, I'm going to plot out in infinite detail what are the steps the customer has to go through to buy that car? What paperwork do they fill out? Uh, when does it have to get, go get approval from a manager, the man behind the curtain <laughs> or woman behind the curtain? Why is it that when I buy a car and we're making a deal, hold on, I got to go check with the guy behind the curtain. It doesn't say that, but <laughs> that's what I feel like. There's a guy named Oz behind the curtain who's <laughs> driving whether or not I'm going to make this deal. Uh, but it, no, what is the process? And then look at for the friction points. Is there any place in here where you think that the customer may say there's friction? And start there, and then you'll see the opportunities. Another thing I want you to think about is asking your, your customer the one thing question. And I have a number of one thing questions, and this is one of my favorite, what I call the convenience one thing question, and it's carefully worded. Is there one thing that you can suggest that would make doing business with us easier or more convenient? That's it. Now, I used to use, is there one thing you can think of that would make doing business with us easier? And then people would rack their brains thinking about things and making things up, uh, you know, just to appease me. I don't want them to think anymore. I want them to say, this is a suggestion that I have for you. So there's a one thing that you can suggest that would make doing business with us more convenient. And uh, if you want to get more broader than it would make doing business with us better. So you're looking for that one thing suggestion. And when you hear one thing coming from one person out of, you know, a hundred customers or a thousand or 10,000 customers, probably not real important. But if you hear customers saying the same thing over and over again, ah, now, and if they were already happy with you, it's an opportunity to improve on greatness. It always comes back to the customer. So yep. we could probably talk all day, Chef. We I can, we can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we're running out of time, so I want to ask you a, a one thing question to, to wrap us up today, and that is, what's maybe one thing you'd like to share with, with readers or prospective readers who are thinking about checking out your book? And, and as, a, as a reader myself, I have to say, uh, I highly recommend it. I enjoyed it. I think it's very valuable. So what's one thing that, that you'd like to share with people who are thinking about this book? Well, I'm so excited because regardless of whether you're a solo entrepreneur maybe you're even somebody that works in a company because convenience is about a relationship enhancer, a service enhancer to either your internal and external customers. So I would think uh, if I want to stand out, if I want to create confidence with my customers, what can I do just to be easier to do business with? Gosh, it's that simple. If you think to yourself, simply ask, how easy am I to work with or how easy am I to do business with? And where are the points that I aggravate people? If I've got an opportunity to bring something to them rather than make them come to me, I should do it. If there's a chance that we're going to have a phone call, why don't I make it easy? Hey, I'll call you at the number you want me to call you on. So you don't, you know, the phone will ring at the right time. Don't worry because I'm all over that. But you don't have to watch your clock anymore because... It's just more convenient. Anyway, think about that. It's not just for companies. It's for people too. It's not just for outside customers. It's for fellow employees and colleagues as well. Be easy to work with and do business with. Oh, that's fantastic. Chef, thanks so much for doing the interview today. The, the book is The Convenience Revolution. It comes out on Tuesday, October 2nd, 2018. Uh, and of course, it's available on Amazon. Of course. <laughs> By the way, I'll make you a deal because I know you're going to, you're going to, this will give an incentive for those that go to Amazon and buy the book. If you shoot me an email over to my website, uh, you can go to, you know, info at hiking.com. If you let me know, I will immediately send you the ebook. Uh, best, I, 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 I'll be checking, even over the weekend, I'll check my emails, you know, prior to the launch. And within a short time, you'll have the ebook before you actually get the hardbound book so that you'll be able to start reading it the same day that you you uh, order it. So I promise this, if you 
order it on Amazon. I'll get you the ebook uh, as long as you do it before October 2nd. All right, even more convenient. <laughs> <laughs> Chef, thanks so much. I really appreciate it and, and enjoyed our conversation today. You too, Jeff. Thanks for having me. It's great to, uh, great to be hanging with you. You bet.